Hello, everyone. I'm John Napolitano, CEO of U.S. Wealth Management, here with Jeff Buckbinder, VP and Equity Strategist at LPL Financial. We've got some interesting things for you today. I know a lot of you are concerned, maybe worried about what's going to happen with the election next Tuesday. What does that mean to the markets? What does that mean to your tax return? What does that mean to your life? Uh, we're here today to kind of allay your fears, hopefully help you alleviate and reduce your anxiety level, and look at some of the facts as to what's happened from 1950 to today in order to kind of make your decisions and understand that the world is not going to come to a rumbling end next week or whenever the election results are finally tallied and accepted by both candidates. Jeff, I appreciate you being here today. It's really great to see you again. Thank you for joining us. Likewise, John, good to be with you. Um, th thanks, thanks for having me. So um, I'll go ahead and, and uh, share my screen here and we'll bring up Fantastic. the presentation. So this should work. So is that, is that showing up? <laughs> yeah, it does. It's not full screen, but I see slide number one. Okay, there we go. Beautiful. So there you see who I am. Uh, I think you've done this before. I have done this before. Uh, so again, Jeff Bookbinder here. Uh, it's good to see some of you again. Uh, you know, I've talked to you guys a number of times, so thanks for having me back. Um, so I'm going to focus here uh, on the election and really the um, and the markets and economy in relation uh, to the election. I have a conversation here with with John. I think the if, if there's one point I want to make here more than anything else, it's that uh, the the economic cycle is, and you know, with that, um, how uh, corporate profits look are much more important than who's in the White House in terms of driving performance of stocks over time. So really, really important point, point I'll lead off with. So here um, you see a chart showing monthly returns in recent decades and then highlighting election years. So October is normally a, a, actually a really good month for stocks based on the S&P 500. But look at October, that little green bar pointing down. Whoops, I went too fast. That green bar pointing down shows that during October, as we've seen here uh, this year, stocks do tend to fall. That's normal. Markets are uncertain about the policy environment going forward and tends to show a little bit of volatility. Uh, now, the good news is it's temporary. You can see that on this slide. This is the average performance of the S&P 500 during election years. So you take the path of the stock market every year, you know, every four years, average them all together, back to 1950 and you get this line. So what's really easy to see here again, Octobers tend to see some volatility, but the good news is after you get clarity on the outcome, sometimes it comes right away, sometimes <laughs> it doesn't, uh, and it may not come right away this time, but uh, key point is whenever that clarity comes and the markets know what they're dealing with, uh, stocks tend to rise. So we anticipate that happening again this time. We think stocks are going to be higher at the end of the year uh, than they are right now, uh, regardless of the outcome. I think that illustrates clearly that when people are confused, markets are confused, it's not a good sign. And the people sell, people think it's right to go to cash. And then a month or two later, they look back and think, oh my gosh, what did I do? Because that second half of the decision, getting out's easy when to get back in is tough. And as you can see at the very bottom of that, bottom right of that yellow chart, uh, that would be the time to get in. But that's exactly the time when most people that think timing is the right thing to do are most panicked. Absolutely. You know, we saw this in uh, you know, 2008 when Obama won, some Republicans sold stocks in response. And then 2016 when Trump won, some Democrats sold stocks in response. In both cases, uh, the wrong choice. Now, um, we don't know what's going to happen you know, in the presidential election, of course, at this point, or the senatorial race, which is really tight, it appears, in, in the swing states. Um, there's the, this, this chart shows you how stocks have historically done uh, under gridlock, which is the split Congress on the right, 
or under full control. So, you know, at this point, based on the polls, it looks like there might be um, uh, a slight, you know, slightly better than 50-50 chance that the Democrats take the Senate. Uh, who knows at this point, some of these races are really close, but certainly there's a possibility that we end up in that middle uh, category here where you see the SP 500 up an average of 10.7% if the Democrats are fully in control. Now, the most important point to make here, uh, I think, is that stocks go up under all of these scenarios most of the time and solid returns on average. So, you know, reg again, regardless of the outcome, we're not going to recommend folks sell stocks, uh, even if taxes go up. Uh, the, um, the market is very adaptable and very resilient, corporate America's as well. So we think- Jeff, I, I take two things away from this. One is the disparity between a, a Republican Congress and a Democratic Congress is not that great. So in my opinion, it's not worth losing sleep over that. Um, and the second part is, you know, companies pay executives a lot of money to make next year better than last year. And I don't think that they make their corporate policy decisions based on who's in the White House or who's sitting in Congress. So, you know, those are my two takeaways from this slide. Thank you. Absolutely. And for, for folks wondering why we might see better performance in a gridlock or divided government scenario, um, I would say it's largely because you take out the extremes of policy. When you give people the status quo, they know what to expect. It's easier for companies to plan uh, and you just kind of sail right on through. So there is sure a possibility that if we do get change in Washington, you might see lower returns, might see a little bit of volatility as markets uh, adjust, but that is totally normal, totally temporary. So, um, you know, taxes are probably the first thing people uh, worry about when they talk about a possible uh, blue wave. And certainly um, we could see Meaningful tax increases, in fact, could be the I mean, pretty close to the biggest tax increases that we've we've ever seen. You know, for me as a market watcher, the corporate rate probably most meaningful. Uh, if we do go from twenty one percent to twenty eight percent, that will still be well below where we were uh, before um, Trump cut uh, that corporate rate. We were in the mid thirties, uh, so it, it's clear that. Markets do have the ability to withstand that, uh, but it will have um, a little bit of a negative impact on earnings, which will make stocks look a little bit more expensive uh, in the short term. However, you know, I'll throw this over to John, but before, um, before you get too worried about tax increases possibly coming, I mean, first Democrats would have to take the Senate, uh, but also keep in mind that a lot of spending is going to come with these tax increases if, if we get them. And that's revenue for companies. So John, your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, completely revenue for companies. In fact, they've even said what type of spending it might be. It's infrastructure, it's healthcare, it's roads, it's bridges. It's some fundamental things that we all know have been in disrepair for decades in this country. So that will find its way down to the workers and will have an impact on GDP, probably a positive impact. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll show you the, the spending here on the next slide, but before I do, some, some are worried about higher capital gains taxes. Actually, um, taxes, when capital gains taxes have been increased historically, stocks have been up one year later. You see a little bit of a mixed bag six months after, but one year later, in those, uh, we have four cases in modern history, uh, stocks have been higher. So that, that should be comforting. So here's the spending, right? Uh, billions, uh, tr sorry, trillions of dollars in spending proposals to accompany the tax increases. Biden wants to raise taxes so he can fund his spending initiatives if he gets in office, right? And so here you see uh, a lot of companies, a lot of healthcare companies are certainly gonna see some revenue uh, renewable energy projects, certainly uh, a lot of companies, you know, pick and shovel companies that, that, um, you know, are going to, um, build out the infrastructure and, you know, potentially make our economy, uh, more green. Uh, and then you see education, housing, a number of, uh, areas where, uh, Biden plans to spend. This will help offset 
the negative impact of higher taxes on, uh, on corporate profits. A lot of spending. And by the way, we're also going to get potentially, uh, if, if Biden wins, a reduction or elimination of the China tariffs that Trump put in place. So uh, that's something else to consider as an offset. So um, what you're looking at here is uh, S&P 500 earnings per share uh, this year and next year based on consensus estimates. By the way, earnings season has been really good uh, thus far. Uh, so these numbers are even a little low. So 162 in earnings per share for the S&P next year. If you do the corporate tax hike, you go down to 146, but the tariffs come off, you go back up to 154. And this doesn't incorporate any spending. So if you get, we'll probably get a fiscal stimulus package in early 2021, and we'll get all this spending to accompany the tax hikes that Biden wants to do. Uh, this 154 could be right back up at 160, uh, potentially when you incorporate all those factors. So it's really important to take a holistic uh, view, uh, we think as investors, when uh, thinking about tax hikes. And, you know- Yeah, this, it looks to me, Jeff, comfort. you know, your consensus, even without uh, the China tariffs, it's still greater than a 10% increase in earnings per share. That's pretty strong. Absolutely. Well, cause we're coming out of a recession and you know, what happens when you come out of recession and you, you see massive GDP growth, like we saw in the report yesterday, you get uh, an earnings rebound. And so, yes, we are very confident that we'll get a strong earnings rebound in 2021. Certainly it'll be stronger if we can end this pandemic uh, in the first few months of next year, but either way, uh, we are poised for uh, much better earnings next year. Again, no matter what the political environment uh, looks like. So, um, you know, here again, um, we don't know wh which way this is going to break, but if we do get uh, a Biden White House and a, a Democratic Senate, a Democratic sweep, that means we will probably get those tax increases. Some of the, some of the spending I just showed you, um, you know, there's another question of whether the filibuster goes away. We can leave that for another time. But mm -hmm. the most important point to make here on this slide is that look at all these green numbers under full Democratic control. These are Democratic presidents with a Democratic controlled Congress. And you see 83% um, of those years were up and they were up really strong, uh, you know, an average of 13%. So, you know, not only, you know, not, not only good performance, but better than you normally get in any random year. So really good to see. So for folks who are worried about this, uh, about the uh, concentration of control, um, th this, is, this is certainly comforting. Well, let's hope history repeats itself here. Absolutely. We're just writing our 2021 outlook now, so I can't give you a forecast, but we expect stocks to be higher next year um, based on, on how we see the world today. Fantastic. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's the pattern you see early in business cycles. That's where we are, just coming out of recession. So um, these next couple of slides just show you some policies. We mentioned a couple of these already. But, uh, you know, in a Biden win, infrastructure almost certainly happens. It might happen if Trump wins, too. Uh, you might get some better performance from industrial companies, uh, commodity companies that are inputs into infrastructure and inputs into, uh, you know, making our economy more green. So um, th those are probably the biggest, most dramatic changes we could potentially see. Uh, trade policy is, you know, as, as I just alluded to with the China tariffs, that's certainly a big deal. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not going to make any dramatic changes to our recommendations or, or model portfolios that we run uh, based on the election. However, um, you know, it might get us a little closer to, um, you know, an upgrade to international markets. They could do a little bit better here if the dollar weakens and if the trade environment uh, is, um, you know, a little less contentious, and some think Biden would be, uh, you know, more willing to work with uh, Europe and China, S still take a tough stance on China, but um, maybe diffuse the tension a bit, and that could be better for um, international stocks, which have certainly struggled recently to um, 
uh, to keep up with the U.S. You know, uh, maybe I'll, uh, John, if you want to comment on any of these other policies, otherwise we'll just keep moving yeah, on. Yeah, no, let's see what happens on the other side. Let's see what your thoughts are there. <clears throat> keep moving. So um, Trump wins. You, I mean, certainly at a high level, you'll get continuation of the policies that we've seen uh, the past four years. So President Trump uh, tends to be more uh, favorable for the energy sector. It's a tough transition, certainly to renewables for the um, the big oil companies, uh, defense and aerospace. You know, even though Trump is somewhat of a pacifist, um, certainly the Republicans are more favorable to um, defense and aerospace. Probably would see fewer, uh, see more resilient defense spending under under Trump, um, where Biden wants to cut it. Uh, financials, you know the. Republicans are a little bit more friendly in terms of regulations on financial services companies, but um, you know certainly uh, we at LPL think we can continue to thrive no matter what uh, the environment uh, looks like. And I think the um, financial sector can continue to thrive as well. The banking system, in particular, so so vital. You know the engine, the grease that keeps our economy rolling. Um, you know, the, if you get dividend tax hikes, you might see some pressure in dividend stocks, but probably not meaningful. And by the way, some of this is already starting to be priced in. So don't expect some of these relationships to, you know, show up right after election day. Uh, there are a lot of countervailing forces here, uh, and, and and some of this is, is, is priced in. Um, I think that's those are probably the main ones I would hit under uh, under Trump. I mean, maybe the last thing. Then, John, you can weigh in. Uh, Republicans and Democrats both agree that big tech and big social media probably need to be uh, regulated a little bit. That might be different under Biden versus Trump, uh, but um, that will be a challenge. We still think there's a lot of opportunities in those areas, especially while we're still in a pandemic. But um, the regulatory environment might get a little bit tougher uh, under Democratic leadership than it has been under Republicans. I think this makes a lot of sense, Jeff. And the one thing I guess I'd like to, to underscore is there's opportunities on both sides. Neither of us plan to make major changes regardless of who wins. And a highly unlikely event would be a Republican sweep of Congress as well as the White House. So I think for anyone that would be you know, against that or equally concerned about that, that's probably a fear we can uh, let lay down right now. I don't think you have to worry about that too much at this point, but interesting. I'm happy to see that there's positives under both. Absolutely. Yeah, the House is just going to be um, really tough for the Republicans to flip, even if Trump wins, um, you know, by a meaningful margin. So um, it's possible, but but highly unlikely. The um, So, you know, this is where we kind of get into, well, what's the market and the economy telling us about the election? And here, uh, what this says, and it's what we all know, right? The economy influences voters. And what you've seen here, um, you know, all the way back to Coolidge, about 100 years ago, um, if you have a recession in the back half of the president's first term, then that president is not reelected. That's happened all four times. If you don't have a recession in the back half of that first term, then the president is reelected, right? So this, this indicator, it's a very simple indicator, uh, but it's worked for almost a hundred years now. So this suggests that, um, you know, it's an uphill battle for President Trump because we just had a recession. We think it's over, but we just had one. Now, the caveat to this, uh, I would say is that the momentum, and we just got the GDP report, the momentum is historic. And so this really sharp rebound as the economy has reopened could help uh, President Trump win over some voters, certainly. And historically, there's a strong correlation between income growth. So how much money do people have in their pockets? And how is that changing? And that actually is looking pretty good for President Trump. Now, it's been supported by stimulus, right? Those checks that people got in the mail, the $1,200 or the 
um, you know, extended unemployment benefits and all of that. But nonetheless, if you take the national income data, it's actually trending higher still, uh, which suggests, you know, Trump still has a chance to win over voters on the economy. So, you know, this slide says, says Biden wins, but it's, it's such an unusual year, unusual circumstances, a lot of momentum right now in the economy. So it could be closer than people think. Um, another signal that suggests, um, well, it suggested that President Trump was the favorite, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. Now it's actually starting to lean the other way. This is what does the stock market do right before the election? So in the three months before the election, if stocks are up, incumbents tend to win. So that would favor Trump. If stocks are down three months before the election, that tends to favor the challenger. So that would favor Biden. Well, we were up big uh, in early September. Then we gave back those gains, you know, suggesting maybe a closer race. Then we rallied back again. This this chart was priced, um, um, you know, about a, ten days ago or so. Now, then we rallied back again a little. Now we're giving back those gains again. So, um, you know, as we're recording this, Biden. This points to Biden slightly because stocks are just slightly down, but really, really uh, close. And so. You know, you don't want to put too much weight on one indicator and in, in, in just a couple of days. But if, if stocks, um, you know, rally back on Monday uh, ahead of the election, that potentially could be a positive sign. If they don't, a uh, positive sign for Trump, if they don't, uh, you would say this indicator would, would favor Biden. You know, a lot of people are also looking at, um, you know, how renewable energy stocks are doing, and they're actually doing pretty well. Those tend to be, you know, Biden favored. So, you know, that suggests possibly, um, you know, Biden a favorite. So those are some of the indicators we're watching. Again, mixed signals, maybe a tiny bit pointing to Biden at this stage, uh, but, uh, but, but pointing to a close race. So um, let's turn to, you know, more forward looking. This is what happens the year following a reelection. So if Trump wins next year, you could expect an average of 10% gains for the S&P 500, 71% chance of a positive return, right? We would definitely take that if that is indeed what we get. But I'll emphasize again, and I know John agrees with me on this, the economy and what companies are doing matters much more than who's in office. So um, this is, um, you know, this suggests incumbents tend to do pretty well. But we also, you know, with the stock market the following year, but we also saw democratic sweep scenarios, uh, stocks tend to do very well. Now, this is the other side of the table I just showed you. This shows you how um, stocks have done after incumbents have, have lost, uh, essentially. You have a new president. Uh, here, you only get an average of about a 5% gain, and you're only up about 50% of the time. And why is this? I think, you know, beyond just where the economic cycles were during these periods of time, I would say it reflects the uncertainty about the policy roadmap as companies try to figure out the rules of the road. So still up, again, up in either scenario, historically, much more often than not, uh, and uh, you know, average, average again, you know, stocks are up about 70% of all years, uh, but uh, even in this scenario where you get a new president and the market you know, might struggle to um, adapt to that, you still get gains. So I think that's a really important point, John. I agree. And not to mention all the fundamental tailwinds that we have going for us right now, low interest rates, the Fred, the Fed printing money and, and writing checks, the Fed acting really fast to, you know, make what is a recession could have been a lot worse. Um, corporate earnings, Obviously, unemployment's an issue today, but I believe that too is a little temporary. So there are a lot of great tailwinds behind this economy that does override who sits in uh, Pennsylvania Ave, for sure. Yes, and markets are forward-looking. They're looking beyond the pandemic. They're looking beyond the election. Uh, this, um, this market will adjust to the new reality really fast. Um, I mean, look what happened in 2016, which we all remember, right? Some were worried about the markets yeah. under President Trump, uh, the sell-off related to that happened overnight in futures and 
most of us didn't see it at all, <laughs> right? And then it was off to the races. We think we could see similar thing this time. Stocks uh, after an adjustment period move higher. So um, that's all I have for slides, John. We'll of course um, show these important um, disclosures <laughs> as we always do. Wicked important. Wicked important disclosures. We'll all read um, every word. So thanks to, um, to you, John, for, for having me on. Uh, great conversation and um, you know, looking forward to, to talking to you again soon. And I hope all of, our, all of your clients watching enjoyed the, uh, the presentation. Well, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. And I'm glad we were able to get through this nice and briefly. So we didn't cause you to take up too much time out of your busy day. The bottom line is clear, though. There's two things that you need to remember. Number one is either outcome does not single signal the end of the world, nor radical changes that are needed. The second, I hope you understand now the value of financial planning and making sure that you're income taxes are planned, your estate is planned, your family governance plan is all set, is way more important than A, the returns on the investments, and B, clearly, who's in the White House. And that will continue to be our focus for you, making sure that your entire financial plan is in sync with everything. And with a little bit of help, markets will be in sync with your needs and what you need to get to point B. So, Mr. CFA Jeff Buckbinder, VP, Equity Strategist, LPL, Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I can't get enough of it. And to you that have taken the time to watch this, I thank you. I appreciate you being here. Feel free to send this off to a friend. And we hope that you have a wonderful time next Tuesday watching the results roll in.